morning, River City. How are you guys? Yeah? Excellent. Love to hear it. Would you stand with us this morning as we enter into worship? Father God, we just come before you a grateful people, Father. Grateful to be known by you and to know you. Lord, would you be honored and lifted up in our praises this morning? We want to worship you with everything that we say and do. We love you, God. This is all for you.
Father, we believe that this morning. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you are Lord. And as your people, God, we declare that together this morning. Jesus, we are so grateful to be known as your people. Jesus, we worship you because you are worthy of all of our honor and glory.
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Jesus, we rejoice in you this morning. Jesus, we rejoice through trials knowing that our faith is being refined. We rejoice that our hope is not in the outcome of our situation, Father, but in who you are. You are so good. You are so powerful. You are so worthy, Father. And we give you what is yours. Would you be honored here today, Father? Worthy of every song we could ever say. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Mm -hmm. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only Save. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And hope.
May that be our cry as we go out into the world, Father, that is wrecked with fear and anxiety and worry. We will not be shaken. Your people, God, stand firm on your foundation, your truth, the hope found only in you, Father. May we be defined by the unshakable nature of our faith. Jesus, we worship you. We exalt you. You are worthy of all of our praise. You are worthy of all of our praise. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a We believe that. We will not be shaken because we are yours. We belong to the king who has conquered death, conquered anything this world could throw at us, Father. You have already won. We trust in that, Jesus. We trust in you, Father, because you are worthy and you are good. It is our joy to praise you, God. May today and every day of our lives be a reflection of our faith in you, a reflection of the goodness of our Father. Jesus, we love you. We worship you. And it's in your heavenly name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, team. Well, good morning, everybody. We're so glad you're here. God is good, isn't he? God is good. Come on now. Jerry, I'm going to talk over you, Jerry, over there. Come on. Nobody's louder than my brother Jerry over there. I love it. Anyway, if you're a guest here, we're glad you're here. We'll just welcome some people around you, and we'll get started with the service. Go ahead. All right, all right, all right. Well, we're excited you're here today. We, um, if you're joining us, we're in a City on a Hill campaign. And are you excited about what God's doing in our church through this campaign? It is awesome. Here's what I, here's what I sense. It's the Lord is just saying, come closer to me. The whole campaign, right? Just come closer to me. It's an opportunity for us to hear from him what he's doing. And listen, if you are a person who's dissatisfied with the world in its current condition, please tell me you are. Please tell me you are. This is the opportunity that God says, come closer to me because I want to do something. And he's going to use every single one of us in an important, powerful way. And so City on the Hill is really, God, what are you saying for our generation? What are you doing in our world? How are we a part of it? How is this church a part of it? And so it's a huge campaign. It's a huge message. And I'm excited about it. And I've been praying about it for a long time. And I'm eager for our Pledge Sunday coming up next week. 
And uh, all that's God's doing. And one of the things that I want to invite you to, if you're, if you're one that's still getting the excitement yet, it hasn't hit. I hope it's hitting. We've got another week, right? But we're praying that, that we all get that excitement. Because the excitement comes when you hear from the Lord, right? You've got to hear from the Lord. And so the, all things about the campaign, it's a holistic thing of God calling us closer to him, closer to his presence, closer to his plan. But what's unique about it is that there's going to be something that's going to catch your eye, right? Some people, they're a little crazy. They're like, I love that we're paying off debt. woohoo!" And they get excited about that. The rest of us roll our eyes and say, man, that's boring, right? <laughs> Some of us get excited about ministering to kids in sports. Some of us get excited about making things beautiful, about new programs. And one of the things that I'm truly excited about is what God is doing in our community outreach ministry, our food, our feeding, our vocational training. And so that's one of the projects I'm getting excited about, right? And so I encourage you, whatever excites you, man, just latch on to that and say, yeah, man, that's why I'm given is because of this thing right here. And God's going to give a different passion to all of us. But for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about when I say our community outreach and I don't talk, talk about our feeding ministry, one of our projects is a new food warehouse, something we desperately need. Somebody's excited about that. I think I know who that was. <laughs> Everyone knows who that was, right? There's no mystery there. But we want to invite you, if you've never seen where we're working right now in Concession 2, we want to do a quick walking tour right after this service. So all you need to do is uh, pick up your kids, walk out these doors, and then right at the entrance to the amphitheater, we're just going to walk over to Concession 2. You can see what we're doing, uh, get a quick explanation, different some of the shortfalls that we have, some of the things we need to improve, and why we're raising money for a food warehouse that will serve our entire community. And I'm excited about this. Many are. And so if you don't know much about that, we invite invite you after service, grab your kids, go out to the amphitheater, and we'll do a quick walk-in tour, take about 10 minutes, okay? That's one of the things coming up. Awesome. Well, uh, we've been going through a series. Pastor Sean's been leading us through this step-by-step. Step. He's got a great message for us today. Would you welcome Sean as he comes and shares? Thanks, Mike. How's everybody doing? Isn't the Lord good? I love that, because Mike pointed out... Um, Everybody gets fired up about different parts of a project like this, and that's okay, you know, because that's vision. You know, if God has given you a vision to see financial health, right, that's an important piece of everything we do. If God's given you a vision to see sports outreach to the community, a gymnasium to be able to minister and serve through our school and through outreach and sports to our community, that's vision. If he's given you vision for what this campus can be and what this church is supposed to be as we, we declare the word of God and we exalt the name of God, that's vision, okay? So I just want, I want all of us to be praying. That's what this next week is about, okay? Really being in prayer and saying, God, give me your vision, all right? Because that's what we want to see. This week, three big things coming up. I want to put a slide up and just show you what they are. Very simply... October 28th, what we're going to do is a prayer walk. Let me tell you about this prayer walk, okay? Some of you are not going to walk the prayer walk, okay, because it's a long prayer walk, all right? Some of you are going to drive the prayer walk. It might be a prayer drive for some of you, okay? That's cool. No judgment here, all right? But we're going to meet. There will be tents, little blue tents at the areas where the gymnasium is proposed, that proposed construction site, where the food warehouse construction site is, and then we will be back up at the courtyard. So when you come in, on Saturday, this is a Saturday at four in the afternoon. That's when we're praying, okay? Saturday at four in the afternoon, we're all gonna meet. You literally can just drive over, it's on gate A, along gate A, the big double gate, and you'll see the tent there, you can park there, okay? For those who, we're gonna pray there, we're gonna pray for what God wants to do through that gymnasium, pray for the, the neighborhoods around us, pray for his passion and his vision, and then we're gonna walk, and we're gonna prayer walk, and as we walk, we're gonna pray, God, you provide the resources to redo these parking lots that so desperately need to be done. God, the sprinkler systems that need to happen, we're going to be praying for God to do that, to do that work, because it's his, this is his home, it's his house, okay? So we're going to pray that he will move on the hearts of his people and that he'll provide it. We'll walk all the way over, this is, a, this is a long walk, all the way over to the community outreach site, which is by gate C, okay? So some of y'all, it's fine. You're going to drive, there's going to be a prayer person there, so if you drive over, there'll be someone leading you through some prayer things while you're there, and we're going to pray there, pray together, and then we're going to come up to the courtyard. We're going to worship for a little bit. We've got just very simple, some worship we're going to do in the courtyard, and we're going to pray for what God wants to do for this fellowship, okay? It'll be about an hour, 30, an hour and 30 minutes, an hour and a half for that entire time of prayer. It's just going to be a neat prayer experience. I'd love to see all of us come out and just say we're going to pray, 
right? We're going to pray for what God wants to do and what he wants to say. And then, of course, next Sunday is Pledge Sunday. This is it. So you're praying this week, and then next Sunday we're going to come, and we are going to declare what God has put on our hearts to do. Okay? So even it, the, way, the way the pledge works, remember, this is a three-year campaign. So some people are going to give their pledge out through the whole three years. Some people are just going to give a one-time, hey, this is what God's put on my heart, and I have the cash, I have the resource, I'm going to do that. Either way, fill out a pledge card for us so we know the total amount pledged and given through this congregation. That's our total. Then the following week is what we call First Fruits Sunday. First Fruits Sunday is very simple. As much as the Lord has prospered you to be able to give cash of that pledge up front, we're asking everyone to do as much as they can because that helps us get started. We're not borrowing money. We're actually paying debt off. So the more that we're able to do, so whatever the Lord has prospered you to be able to do, First Fruit Sunday is when you do it. So if your pledge was $10,000 and you said, hey, I've got $2,000 that I can do, if that was where God had you, then you would do that. And then over the rest of the campaign, you would pay out $8,000. That's how this a pledge process like this works. So the big thing right now, you have homework this week. Here's your homework. Pray. What's your homework? Pray. pray. To listen for God's voice, to seek him and pray. And then we're all going to help with your homework on Saturday at 4 o'clock because we're going to pray together, okay? And we'll just do the prayer walk throughout the, the campus and just seek the Lord. And then on Sunday, we're going to respond in obedience. Pretty exciting time. In fact, let me take a time to pray for us right now. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for all that you've blessed us with. Thank you for the resources you've given us. Thank you for this campus that you've given our church, the opportunities you've given us, Lord. Thank you for the good fruit that is already being seen everywhere. Lord, we worship you and we give you praise and glory for that. Thank you. Lord, I just ask that you will move on the hearts of every single family in this church. As we seek your will, as we seek your voice, Lord, I ask that you would help us to just hear you and then respond in obedience. I pray that as couples pray together and as they pray as individuals, you'll speak to them about what they're supposed to do. And they'll know. It's not just them trying to wrestle out what they can do. It's you speaking and that there'll be unity in families, in, in singles, Lord. Give them clarity. Lord, I pray that our, our kids would be included in this and that they would take ownership of this, Lord. Jesus, I just pray that this would be something that would unify this family and focus our hearts, our minds, our resources on who you are and what you're calling us to do. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, now as we get ready to open your word, I pray that you'd speak to us, help us to hear you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as a pastor, one of the things that I get to do, need to do, right, is speak to where the congregation is. God is speaking to our people, and I've had people coming up to me with just unbelievable faith saying, I just have this sense that God is going to do more than we even imagine possible. And I love that. There's a sense of that. And I sense that in our people, and that gets me excited. I've also been getting questions. Questions, I mean, legitimate questions. I had one in one of our meetings, one lady asked, well, why now? Why now for a project like this? I mean, it's a, this is a tough time. Why, why are we taking this out? Why are we doing this now? You know, there's lots of different answers, lots of needs, lots of things we could point to. At the end of the day, the main thing is because we believe God's asking us to, right? You know, that's, that's, our, that's our main, that's the, the main reason, that's our answer, but that's a legitimate question. Why now? Had other people ask, okay, I get it, I see it, I don't know how we're gonna do this. I don't understand how it's going to work. I don't understand how in the part of the church, I don't understand in our own family, with our own resources, I don't know how we're going to be able to do this. I, I, I think I hear God saying something, I just don't see how. And those are good questions. Those are like the right kind of things to begin asking. They're important questions. I want to suggest so many people, I think, miss out on the deeper things of God because we don't know how to process our questions. We don't process our questions well. Think about all the different questions that we have. We, the stuff in our lives, we go, okay, why did that have to happen? I wish it didn't. Why didn't I get the job that seemed just like a perfect fit for me? Why is God blessing my friends, but it doesn't seem like he's blessing me? Why do I have to bear this burden? Why aren't my adult children making better choices? 
Why did God allow the person I love so much to pass away, to die? Why is our culture going insane and falling apart so quickly? Why? See, we all have questions in our personal lives, in our culture, in our faith. And the scripture makes one thing abundantly clear. God is not afraid of our questions. God is not afraid of my questions. Can you say that with me? God is not afraid of my questions. I think sometimes we worry about, oh, I, if I ask a question, am I showing a lack of faith? No. No, I don't think you are. You're asking a question. And the scripture reveals a God who is not afraid of our questions. The problem is, and I want you to hear this, we're often not asking the right question. See, this is a message about the right question. That's what I want us to talk about. In fact, that's the title of the message, The Right Question. Turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 6. It's one of my favorite passages because it is a passage full of questions. A passage full of questions. I'll begin reading at verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw signs, the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Okay, in that we already have, you know, some questions coming on. Why were these people coming after Jesus? Well, because of the signs, the healing. And why did Jesus and his disciples, when he sees this great crowd of people, go up to the mountainside and he called his disciples forward? Mark 6, chapter 6, 31, Mark gives us a little bit of insight into that. He says, he says, there were so many crowds, so many people, so much pressure on their ministry that Jesus called his disciples apart and said, come away with me and rest for a while. Come away and rest for a while. The problem is the crowds followed him. They found him, and they went, and there they were, okay? So verse 5 says, When Jesus looked up, and he saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Can you imagine being Philip? That's kind of out of the blue. <laughs> Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, verse 6 is key. He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Why would Jesus ask that question? Why would he, why would he, we know the scripture said he's testing Philip because he knew what he was going to do. But again, in Mark chapter 6, we're told he went ashore, he saw the great crowd, and he felt compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. See, Jesus is engaging his disciples because he has compassion. On people. He sees what's happening. You know, when we say we're, we're tired of what's happening in this world, we're concerned, we're bothered by what's happening in the world, we need to understand that's legitimate. That's a burden from the Lord. But he looks and he sees not frustration, anger, division. He sees, he has compassion because he sees people who are lost like sheep without a shepherd. And verse 6 is such a key verse. I want you to remember this. He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. See, Jesus wanted to do something. He wanted to do something in Philip and something much more. So where should we buy bread for these to eat? Philip answered him, verse 7. He said it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. It's like this is a large crowd, we're told. And Philip is like... Are you serious, Jesus? You know, some people think he asked Philip because they're in Bethsaida. Phil, Phil, that's where Philip was from. And so he feels like, okay, like Philip would actually start going, well, I guess there's, you know, there's H-E-B, and then there's the one on bitters, and then one on, there's just two over, I bet I could clean out 3009, and, you know. I mean, that, that's where Philip's going. Like, he, he's going to be the guy who's going to actually, it's like, why, why Philip? Well, Philip lived in the area. This is where we would buy. Philip's like, yeah, it would take more than half a year's wages, which, by the way, we don't have Jesus. But if we did, we would only be able to buy a little bit for each person. Another of the disciples, Andrew, Simon's Peter brother, 
Simon Peter's brother spoke up. Well, here's a boy with five barley loaves, small barley loaves, and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? So Philip is just kind of like almost sarcastic and just like, Jesus, come on, really? Andrew's a little more proactive. He's a little more of that worker guy. Okay, let's go. Jesus wants to feed people. Mm, let's do this. And he goes out. Nobody brought lunch. They just, they heard Jesus was there. They just followed. And so there's one kid who's got a lunch. And he says, well, this is it. But like Philip said, this isn't anything. This isn't enough to give everybody a, a, a crumb. See, what's interesting is Philip and Andrew are asking the same question two different ways. How in the world do you want to do this, Jesus? Because this is impossible. How do you want to do this? Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Plenty of grass in the place. They sat down. About 5,000 men were there. And we know there were women, likely, and we know there were kids, because at least one kid had his lunch, right? So there's lots, thousands of people. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. He distributed as much as they want. This, I, I've, I've taught this to students or kids before, and I talk about, you know, this is like Jesus pulling out a Lunchable, and he's going to feed us all now, right? This, and he just, and all he does is he gives thanks, and he starts serving, handing out, and it just keeps being enough. There just keeps being enough. It's like, at first, they're like, okay, this, uh, you have to know the disciples are like, okay, Jesus, it's on you. This has been a nice ride, but it's pretty much over after this. And then all of a sudden, as the, the food just keeps coming, and, the distribution, and it starts spreading through the crowd, and people who are noisy talking and all wondering what's going on, they all get quiet because they realize they're sitting in the presence of a miracle. And they watch it begin to happen. How long did this take for these disciples to spread? And they got other people involved, and they're just standing, and Jesus is just keeps breaking the bread, and it just keeps being enough. When they'd all, verse 12, when they'd all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. I love that there's 12, one for each of his disciples. You know, it's, it's, and I, we, don't, we don't know. They didn't say that he gave one to each of them. That doesn't tell us that, but it's just kind of interesting to consider. It's like you guys have all just been in school. See, the question that I think everybody would have been asking that day as they're watching this happen is, how in the world did Jesus do this? This is just a miracle. How did that happen? What actually happened? And why leftovers? What was he trying to do? What was he trying to say? Well, we know verse 14, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is a prophet. This is the prophet who's come into the world. Jesus, knowing they intended to come make him king by force, force withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When they call him the prophet, they're talking about the one who's promised of God, not just a prophet. Okay? Their terminology is not right. They're not, yet, they're not yet saying Messiah. They're saying, though, the one who's promised. And that's probably why they want to make him king. Because remember, they're looking for political deliverance. They don't understand that he came to save the people from their sins. They think he came to save them from the Romans and from their enemies and from their oppressors. And so they literally try to make, they, they're, gonna, they're planning on trying to make Jesus king because they've seen this incredible miracle. And that's why he withdraws. So as we look at this whole thing, we just go, what was Jesus doing? Why was he dead set on feeding this multitude. And I think there's so many reasons. One is he just had compassion and they were hungry. You ever just stop and think about that? They just needed food. Jesus just cared that they were hungry. But we also know he wants to teach and challenge his disciples. He wants to do something impossible. He wants them to go from, from this thing of, of, yeah, Jesus, you know, Philip sitting there looking at the crowd going, it's so big, there's no way. And Andrew's sitting over there looking at this lunch going, it's so small, there's no way. And he wants to teach them to where they get to actually have their hands on the miracle and pass it out, serve everybody, and they walk home with a basket. From no way to, oh my gosh. I've just been a part of a miracle. 
He wanted to reveal something to this group of people. They saw something different. I think he wanted to work through a little boy in a way that would change his life. Can you imagine being that little boy? Who went through the very challenging and tricky thing of giving his lunch away. You ever tried to take a lunch from a little boy? Okay, not cool, not cool at all. But he, d- he gave it to Jesus, and because of it, he got to be part of a miracle. See, we can c- have all these reasons why Jesus might have done it. Here's the truth. Only Jesus knows why he did it. Isn't that right? At the end of the day, he's the one who knows. And the disciples' cl- questions were completely logical. Jesus, this seems impossible. How are you going to do it? How are you going to feed the crowd? What's funny is we still don't know how he did it. We just know that he did it. We don't know exactly how he did it. We just know that he did it. And what's interesting is most of our big questions that we ask, stop and think about it, the big questions we ask about life, we're going to ask questions about, about like what, why, how, kind of the logistic questions. What should I do? What's the next step? What's going to happen when I do that? Why is this happening? Why me? Why is this important? How do I get from here to there? How is this going to work out? How am I going to do this? How is this going to end? What? Why? How? That's the questions that we kind of ask when we're going in to do something. And see, I think when we do that, we're trying to solve the problem before asking the right question. And see, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. When facing big decisions, the right question is always who. Let me say that again. When facing big decisions, the right question is always who. The most important question is not what, why, or how. The most most important question is always who. Not that those other questions aren't important, and we won't get to those, but they're secondary. See, we usually go down the road of trying to get all of our questions answered before we answer the most important question, the right question, and that is who. Who. Let me give you three important who questions that you have to ask in any big decision that you make when following Jesus. Number one, the first Question, who do I ask? That's kind of an important question. Who am I going to ask my question? When I wrote that down in my notes, I immediately thought of Home Depot. Mm, mm, You've been there. Just looking for that orange vest, just somebody with an orange vest, anybody. And it's funny, when, when when I do... I feel like a mariachi at Mi Tierra or something. Because you know how you look away when the mariachi comes? Because you know you're going to get charged. If, they, if, you, if you look them in the eye and they start playing, you know, you're, you're going to get charged. Okay? It's just the rules. It's how it works. So, you know, you don't look them in the eye. That's where the Home Depot point, uh, employees are towards me. I'm walking around holding some part, the wrong part, wanting to figure out, you know, I want someone who knows. And there's some kid there working, and he just pretends I'm not there. Or that you do see one person who's answering a question and there's 15 customers around him. Yeah, it, it, we, you share my pain. You know what? I, I want to find that guy. I want to find that guy who clearly is just completely experienced. He's built like 15 houses on his own. That's the guy I want. That's who I want to ask my question. Or the woman who's worked there forever, she knows the inventory better than anybody. She knows every aisle. She knows everything. She absolutely, and she can just say, yep, that part you're looking for, that's aisle over here. But here's the thing. With me, I'm not, it's not the part. I'm like, okay, I want to do this. How would you do that? And I want someone who can help me. And those are getting fewer and farther between, right? See, the first part when you have a question is knowing who you're going to ask. That's it. And obviously... When you say, okay, well, I want the true expert, let's start by asking our Father. Isn't that where all our questions should go first? And what's interesting, in this passage, notice that disciples never asked Jesus what he wanted to do. They just never asked him. And what's funny, in Mark 6, we're told, and and I love the way the Gospels work because you get different people telling stories from different perspectives because, you know, there's a big group of people, the disciples, all the leaders, and all these conversations are happening. Mark 6 tells us the disciples, the way this whole thing started, Jesus didn't just come up and say to Philip, where are we going to buy bread for all these to eat? Mark 6 tells us they went to Jesus first and said, hey, Jesus, we should send these people home so they can get something to eat. I'll tell you who wanted to go home and get something to eat. Okay? 
he tells us they said we should send them home. And in Mark 6, Jesus says, well, you give them something to eat. And I can see his next question looking at Philip, who lived in the area. Philip, where are we going to buy bread for all these people to eat? Uh. But they never ask Jesus, Jesus, here we've got all these people. What do you want to do? They start making suggestions. Then John tells us that not when this conversation really gets going, they just start basically making, kind of stating the case that what Jesus is asking is impossible. They, are, they start just saying it's impossible. When it, com- when it comes down to, oh, Jesus wants to do something for these people. He wants us actually to be involved in doing something. He wants us to feed these people. Yeah, Jesus, that's impossible. Yeah, the crowd's too big. Yeah, all we got is a little lunch. Yeah, not gonna happen. That's where the disciples were. What's interesting is even at the end, when the people discover that this is the promised one from God, they've just seen him perform a miracle by the power of God in front of everybody. Their response is to try to force him to be king. This is the promised one of God. This is the prophet in the world. This is God. Let's force him to be king. Force him, really? It's the whole thing of how hung up we are on our agenda. They find out Jesus is God, or at least he's from God. They don't know yet the full extent. And their thing is, let's get him to do what we want. That's messed up. And it's human, isn't it? See, we need to remember who our father is. When we start asking questions, remember who he is. And when we bring our questions to him, which is where we should always go, remember who he is and that he is God. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2 says, guard your steps when you go into the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Listen. Let's ask him and listen. And remembering who you're asking will always change how you're asking, won't it? When I remember who it is I'm asking, when I go to God and I ask him whatever the question, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? Why did you allow this to happen to my family? God, why are my friends experiencing this but I'm experiencing so different? Remember who you're talking to because remembering who you're asking will always affect how you're asking, because all of a sudden, humility comes in. All of a sudden, there's a humility before God and a sense of listening. We hear him. See, I want to suggest that we ask him with the anticipation of a surrendered heart. You know what the anticipation of a surrendered heart is? It's the heart that, that it says, God, I'm looking forward to what you're going to do. I want to see what you're going to. It's the person who's walked with Jesus a while, watched him feed multitudes, watched him heal the blind, the lame, watched him raise the dead. And so now when we go and we ask, God, what do you want to do? There's this anticipation of a surrendered heart. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't really care what it is because I know you. I've seen you. You're my father. But God, what do you want to do? And there's that, there's that sense of anticipation and excitement because I know you're going to do something. God is always doing more than we can imagine, than we can even grasp. Obviously, I want to just state it plainly. Ask God first. Okay, When we're asking, ask God first. Pray first. Search the word first. I have people throw this back at me all the time. I love it. They mock me with my sermons, which is fun. It's fun being pastor at River City. <laughs> but I've been told, attitude reflect leadership, Captain. <laughs> so. But what people... Oh. <laughs> Do I need to come back there? <laughs> I've got the hot hand. <laughs> Poor little guy. <laughs> it's like that man's angry. 
Yeah, one of the things I always say to people is like, it's so ridiculous that we, we, that phrase, well, all we can do is pray. We pray last. We've done everything else. We've done all our research. We've done all our work. We've done everything we can. All we can do is pray. All we can do now is trust the Alpha, the Omega, the Almighty, right? It's ridiculous when you say it. So now I have all kinds of people around here. You, Kyle, I know you know you're nodding. You're the worst, okay? <laughs> who, who love to point, well, all we can do is pray. Well, as long as we get the message that, yeah, let's pray first. How about we do that? How about we seek the word first? How about we listen for God's counsel first? Do you know he promised to give wisdom liberally, generously, if we'll just ask? The book of James, he just said, ask, and he'll give it generously. Wisdom, whatever it is. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you have at work. I don't know what you have with the family. I I don't know what you're facing, but you do, and God does. And he says, if you'll ask him, he will give you wisdom and he will give it generously. That's awesome. That's the gift of the Lord. Don't pass that up. Don't miss that. Here's the thing. Seek his wisdom with this caveat. Expect his wisdom to be very different from the world's wisdom. And this is one that derails a whole lot of Christians, particularly in more educated Western or wherever, whatever educated circles that you, that you might be in. This derails a little bit because when we ask for God's wisdom and he says something that seems completely unwise by our standards, and it's like, oh, yeah, God, well, that, I, want, I went to you first, but you just you didn't really tell me what I needed to hear. And so... I'm going to do what conventional wisdom says I should do. Yeah, God's wisdom is divine. We should expect that. We should expect it to be different from the world's wisdom. And then whenever we go and ask him a question, then give him time to speak. Listen. Listen through the word. Listen in prayer. Spend some time just listening. And then as you're walking through the course of your days, keep your eyes open. God might be revealing the answer to his question. Keep a listening heart as you go until you hear what the Lord wants to say. See, when facing big decisions, the right question is always who. Who am I going to ask? And the answer is I'm going to ask the Lord. Second question, who do I trust? Who do I trust? Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8 says, This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They'll not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They'll be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its root by the stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Wait a minute. Even in drought, the one who trusts the Lord can be fruitful and productive and growing? Yes. That's what the Scripture is saying. Our Trust is in the Lord. Psalm 56, 3 through 4 says, When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise. In God, I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Now, I really think this is one we have got to, we have got to grab onto because we have this tendency to trust the experts more than we trust God. When it comes to my finances, I trust the financial experts more than I trust the creator of all things. When it comes to medical, I trust the experts. And please understand, I think we should get counsel from experts. Don't don't get me wrong. I think we should always be learning. I think we should be seeking wise advice. I, I think in a multitude of counselors, there's much wisdom. I agree. That being said, do not confuse that as something that stands up and compares to the wisdom and the counsel of God. Because as you go through scriptures, all throughout scripture, God's people had to do things that were completely opposite of what the world would have told them, what the experts would have told them, what their family would have told them, what their friends would have told them, because God was wanting to teach them something deeper. God was wanting to take them deeper. When God asks you to do things that don't make sense to you or that seem contrary to the world's wisdom, just know God is inviting me to go deeper with him because he's going to reveal something to me. He's going to show me his character. He's going to show me his nature. I'm going to get to know him at a different level. I'm going to see things that I couldn't see in, from the safety of my, my kind of cocoon of common sense and conventional wisdom. Don't get 
be confused. When God speaks, his wisdom is different. And it's powerful. It's powerful. See, I have to decide, not only when it comes to experts or others, I have to decide, am I going to trust my plan or his plan? Oh, that just got bad because I love my plan. My plan's awesome. That's why it's my plan. If, it, if I hated it, it wouldn't be my plan. Am I going to trust his plan or my plan? And again, this is all the process of building faith. See, trust is built small steps at a time. It takes practice. Do you, do you, are you aware of that? It takes practice to learn faith and trust in the Lord. And it often starts with small little steps. You know, the, the conventional wisdom is to do this, or the world is telling you to do this, the culture is telling you to do this, but God says, no, I want you to do this. It's like, but God, I'll be the only one. Trust me. And you take a step. And all of a sudden you see him work, and you see a different result, and you see, you see the good fruit on the tree begin to emerge. You see God work through that situation. It's like, Wow. And the next, next, one's, next one's a little bit bigger. It's a little bit bigger step. Maybe a little bit more public, a little more people looking and saying, you're crazy. But God, okay, I'm going to take a step. And all of a sudden you see God do something more than you ever imagined possible. And step by step, the Scripture uses the phrase line upon line, precept or truth upon truth, our faith is built by just stepping. See, and just understand, learning to trust the Lord takes practice. It's not like one day you're going to end up in the World Series of Faith and hit it out of the park. You know, you've, you've been through lots of small steps, lots of small scenarios where you've just learned to hear God's voice and do what he says and trust him. The most important is who, because who do I ask? Who do I trust? When facing big decisions, the right question is always, who? And the last of these who questions is, who do I follow? Who do I follow? I love Joshua 24, 15. He says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods your ancestors served before the Euphrates or beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Who am I going to follow? See, at a certain point, we have to put our faith and our trust in Jesus. We have to decide, okay, I've asked the question. I've listened for his answer. I'm hearing him. And now it's time to follow now I actually have to do what the Lord is asking me to do. Yeah, but that's going to cost me. Yeah, but my friends won't understand. Yeah, but that's going to cause me to lose that client. Yeah, whatever it is, there's always some yeah, but. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. Choose this day whom you're going to follow. As for me and my house, we are going to serve and we are going to follow the Lord. I love this passage. Peter and John are before the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of their day. They're in trouble, actually, because they healed a guy in Jesus' name. And they'd been called in, questioned, and sent out in Acts 4, verse 18 through 20. We read this. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Listen to this. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. See, his word over any other. See, the Sanhedrin wasn't just another religious group. They had legislative power. They had armed guards. They had arrested Peter and John. They're literally saying to them, yeah, you got to decide. You, you, you know. You, choose, you decide. Is it right for us to obey God or obey you? We cannot help but do what the Lord's asked us to do, to speak what we've seen and what we've heard. See, that's what obedience is like. Obedience is that thing where you say, Lord, I trust you so fully, I'm going to follow you. 
And that's where the good fruit comes from. That's where the power comes from. That's where our lives are made different. And it's a process of many daily decisions. Every day, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to listen for his voice. I'm going to do what he says. And what's amazing, in this issue of questions, there are so many answers that you can never get on this side of obedience. Answers that will open up on the other side of obedience. And you'll see, oh, See, had the disciples never followed along with Jesus and said, yeah, no, Jesus, you're crazy. We're not going to do this. They would have never gotten the answers that they did get. They would have never seen the miracle. They would have never experienced the power of Jesus. And when we take steps of obedience, when we trust him and say yes, and we take that step, it's like now we see from a different perspective. We go deeper and we understand more fully. If Jesus is asking you to do something hard and you know he's asking you, just know he's inviting you to go to a deeper place with him. That's the power of God. See, the right question is who? Who am I going to ask? Who am I going to ask? Who am I going to listen to? Who do I trust? Who am I going to follow? I just want to say, if you're here this morning, maybe you've never made the decision to follow Jesus. You're, you're hearing this and saying, wow, you know, um, I maybe, I don't, I don't have that kind of relationship with the Lord, and I'd like to. I just want to say the whole gospel of Jesus Christ is very simply, God created us for this amazing, vibrant relationship with him that would be every day, interactive, a true relationship. And the thing that keeps us from it is our sin, our sin, our rebellion against God that says, no, I'm going to kind of be king of my own life. I don't need a new king. I kind of want to be the king. I want to make decisions. I'm going to do what I want. That's the very heart of sin. And see, Jesus Christ paid the penalty on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. The wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus because he paid the penalty for our sins so we could be forgiven and set free and enter into life with Father. And for us, the step is to say, Jesus I want to follow you. I want to follow you. I repent. I turn from my sin, and I turn to you. And so if you're here, maybe you've never accepted Jesus as Savior, but you want to experience the power of God. You know there's supposed to be more to your life. You know you were created for more. I want to invite you this morning to say yes to Jesus. So I can just get everyone to bow their heads for just a moment. I'm just going to pray for you. I'm just going to pray for you. Jesus, I thank you. For everyone in this room, following along online, wherever they're hearing this message, I just, I thank you because you love them. And Lord, I pray for those who right now are feeling the call of your Holy Spirit. I pray that they would turn to you and tell you yes. Your scripture says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open that door. I will come in and we will fellowship and dine together. Thank you, Jesus. So I pray, Lord, right now for my brothers and sisters in here who know they need to open the door to you. They need to receive forgiveness. If that's you, if you know that's you, I'm going to ask you just to, between you and God, this is just between you and the Lord, okay? I'm going to ask you to say a very simple prayer. And again, it's not some kind of incantation. There's no magic in the words. It is based on Scripture, the heart that we need to turn over to Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to just pray this prayer quietly between you and the Lord. And if you do, sincerely, you will be, Scripture says, a new creation. So pray along with me. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you have made a way for me to be forgiven and to have life in you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I'm a sinner. And I need to be forgiven, Lord. My sin has hurt me. It's hurt others around me. And most of all, Lord, it's hurt you. Forgive me of my sin. I want to turn from my sin. I want to quit being king of my own life. And I want to surrender my life to you, Jesus. Thank you for your death on the cross that paid the death penalty that my sin incurred. Thank you that 
I could be forgiven. I could receive mercy and grace while the judgment for my sin was poured out on you on the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I ask that you'd fill me with your spirit and lead me every day. I want to be a follower of Jesus. Teach me as I begin to open your word each day, Lord. Teach me what it means to follow you. I pray that I would learn to hear your voice. Even in little things, I would learn to hear your voice and follow you every day. And I would experience the abundant life that I was created for in you. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Thank you for calling me home. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Scripture says if you prayed that prayer, yeah, that's, that's Remember last week we saw that when one sinner turns and repents, all of heaven rejoices. There is a party in heaven. And it's not like the golf clap that we just gave. Okay? Oh, nice putt. No, I mean, I'm talking, it is going wild because you have been made new. You are a new creation. Your spirit has been brought to life in Jesus Christ. That's what I'm talking about. That's salvation. Now, for those of us who are believers and River City is our church home, we're at this point of decision with this campaign, the City on a Hill campaign. And what I want you to do this week, I want you just to pray. Because the question is, what is God saying? It's not, what can I afford? It's not, well, what's the minimum I should give? It's not anything like that. It is very simply, what is God saying to me? What does he want me to do to do this work in our community? How does God want to use me? How does God want to stretch me? Because I promise you, he wants to stretch you. He wants to show you a miracle. And so this week, I'm going to ask you to pray. That's your, that's your homework. Pray together, pray individually, come together and decide in your heart, according to scripture, what you're supposed to do. And let's watch God do a miracle through us. Let's experience him doing a miracle. Again, our prayer thing I'm praying for is 100% participation. Everybody's saying yes. And that's going to be different, different levels, different, we're all in different places, but 100% 100% participation is a goal that we can, we can achieve. Lord, I pray for this congregation this week as we go and we pray. I pray that we'll hear your voice. I ask, Lord, that as couples pray separately, you would speak the same thing to them. So when they come together, that's a confirmation, and they hear your word. They hear your voice. Jesus, I ask that you would stretch us so that we would have to depend on you. We wouldn't just do what we think we can cover. Lord, that we would let you stretch us and let you work miraculously through us. Help us to be like that kid who gave his lunch. When the likely prospect, the only thing that was going to happen is he was going to go hungry. That was about all that that looked like in the natural. But then you took it and you multiplied it and you did a miracle. I pray that for every family in this church. We love you, Lord. We worship you. We look forward to what you're going to do as we trust you together as a family. Jesus, thank you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.